The Flying Crank Ghost is one of the most fascinating and effective haunt props you can create. Over the years, it has appeared in amusement park Halloween events and both professional and home haunts around the world. Thousands of them are still flying to this day. This is the 40th anniversary of the FCG, and it is time to make it one of the most affordable Halloween builds around. It is not unusual to see FCGs in crypts in yard haunts. When I was deciding upon the marionette I should use for the FCG light, my thoughts went immediately to Disney's Haunted Mansion. There is a crypt that contains a ghost painted with fluorescent paint onto a black sheet that is blown by a small fan sitting on the ground to the left of it. I thought, why not shape this into a typical FCG configuration? And of course I thought, wow, wouldn't it be neat to see an FCG in this ride? We will be making this new marionette in three sizes. The first and smallest we will finish in this first program. I have redesigned the motor platform for the new system around an affordable but sturdy motor available from Amazon. At the time of this production, the motor was selling for around $6, and it has more than enough torque to run the first two sizes of marionette with no counterweight needed. I am not sure of the durability of the unit, but my guess is that it should deliver for at least three or so seasons. It is certainly no big issue to replace it, should it fail. I would like to talk to you for just a moment about this motor. You will notice that it has a metal case and a pair of wires going into it. Now the thing we need to check is that there is no electrical leakage between the wires coming into the case, either of these wires, and the case of the motor. If there is any leakage, it will not be safe for use outdoors. In fact, I wouldn't use it at all. I suggest that you perform this test on any motor you plan on using outdoors, and especially if it is to be used on any prop that you intend on touching. To perform this test, you'll need an ohmmeter, a VOM like this one, whatever you have lying around, but the more sensitive it is, the better off you are. First of all, connect one lead of the motor to one lead of the meter, and the other lead of the meter to the case of the motor. If it gives any reading at all, you have a problem. Repeat this test with both motor leads. Okay. Here is the piece of birch, 1 8 inch thick plywood, that's in the comments, the URL for that. The size of this is supposed to be 1 foot by 1 foot, but it's more than an eighth of an inch shy in both dimensions. Well, I found the center, obviously, and uh, drew an X through the center of the board. And then I got my protractor and set it for 120 degrees. Uh, why 120 degrees? Well, I will tell you about that after we do this, but just trust me on it for now. I'm going to place that wooden block where indicated right there, and the motor will be where that yellow trademark is. Okay, here's our board trisected into three 120 degree angles and lined up. The dot here in the center I made a mistake and had to erase it. Imagine that. The big dot in the center of the three figures is the where we're going to locate the motor. I accidentally based it on the center of the board after telling myself I wasn't going to do that. So, thank goodness for erasers. Okay, I'm going to go right in the center of this and center punch it. And then I'm going to use the center punch hole line up the drill bit. So you need right around a half inch hole there. It'll be 16, 30 seconds. So yeah, half inch hole in the center. I had to ream that out. I had a 3 8 inch bit. Not quite big enough. So we had to fix it. Here I am in the midst of drilling another three hole washer. A word of advice. 
do not try making parts like this unless you have a vise to clamp them in. Do not be silly and sit there and hold it down with your finger on a piece of wood and try to drill it because every time it will try to fly away or start to spin on the bit after the bit bites it and you will get hurt. Get a vise. Even if it's an inexpensive vise uh, that's got a clamp on it, whatever you can afford, you can go to Harbor Freight if you have to. Just get something that will hold this tightly while you drill it. Again, you'll want a punch of some sort. I bought the kind that you simply push until it pops and it leaves a, a detent. You can buy punch kits that have little straight punches that you hit with a hammer. Either will work just fine. You really do want to use some sort of punch before you start to drill or a drill bit is gonna skitter all over the work and you're gonna be angry. Pay attention to the movement of your three-hole pivot washer as it is typically the single most frequent cause of tangles. Again, make sure it is burnished smooth along with the nuts it bears on. Oil it seasonally with light machine oil as well. It's back to the drawing board time. Look what happens to this plastic crank due to the second hole I drilled in it. It was bending fine and staying, you know, very flexible when I tested it by hand. And then I drilled a second hole in there to give myself an option for the pivot and did the test again and it snapped. Uh, it's time to rethink this crank, isn't it? Okay, so we're making the new crank out of wood the same wood that we're mounting the motor and uh, making the platform out of. And I want you to see this. I used the, uh, the, paint, the painter tape, masking tape method of avoiding splintering. I wanted to show you the results. Check it out. It really works. Tiny little bit of splintering, but nothing bad enough to worry about, right? The exit wound, well, it's a little splintered, but look at it critically. It's not too bad. If we sand that down or get an X-Acto knife and, and slice off the uh, unwanted part, it's pretty much undamaged. Use tape. Here is our new finished crank. Will it be better than the last one? Well, we'll just have to find out. Okay, now I'm going to glue down my three blocks that are designed to hold the uh, guides for the lines. And I have these areas marked. This one will go here, right on our angle lines there. And the main one for the head of the ghost, all the way to the end. Okay, we'll let that dry and then we'll mount the motor. The glue on the blocks is dry. I've installed the motor. You use number 632 machine screws for this. Uh, place washers on this side of the board because this wood is very fragile. If you tighten it too much, the bolts will come through it. On this side, I have the nuts placed and you don't need washers on this side. Uh, and the motor isn't likely to come loose. It doesn't vibrate a lot. So uh, I don't see any need to put lock washers or Loctite on the, on the screws. Motor platform with crank installed. All we have to do is add three screw eyes for the guides for the lines. You can use either monofilament fishing line or cotton quilting thread to string the system. I have never experienced a failure, but with the cotton, I use fresh lengths every new season. Quilting thread is easier to tie, almost impossible to snap by hand, and it is easier to get a strong knot in it.
Fishing line is recommended if you fly ghosts outdoors. Lots of builders have used and recommended fishing swivels, so we show them in use here. When flying outdoors, you really do need a windbreak on three sides. All it takes is one night of high wind to make you sorry if adequate cover is lacking. With these light ghosts, ballast in the form of fishing weights is recommended, even indoors. Experimentation is always a good idea, and do an observed trial run of at least an hour before leaving these props running alone. For the crank, mounting is simplified by this flanged shaft coupler, also from Amazon. It comes with set screws and a wrench and is sold in pairs, as the motors are. But why not build at least two FCGs, since in groups they are very strong attention grabbers? Build one of each size and you'll have the ability to stage some amazing force perspective, and there will be spare parts. Enough for a fourth ghost. Here I am making the molds for the cowlings that will form the torsos of the ghosts. These are the small and medium sizes. Any method you prefer will work, but the foil and masking tape is definitely the quickest. These molds can be reused for making marionettes on an assembly line if you need that to fill a huge scene. I would estimate that Buying supplies in bulk, you can make ghosts for about $15 to $20 each. I always wanted to be able to offer this affordability back in the day, but only recently has it become possible. The cheesecloth we use is available from Amazon as well. We soaked it in a mixture of laundry detergent, 50% detergent, 50% water. Any brand will work as they all contain optical bleach or bluing. Let the cheesecloth soak for about 30 minutes, then rinse it, leaving a small bit of the liquid mix behind to continue the dyeing as it dries. You can use a clothes dryer on high to dry it, since it is made from cotton. Okay, on the left there you can see our two hood forms with saran wrap lining both just inside because what we're going to do we're going to reuse them to make more ghosts in other words we're going to put our draping material down into the form while it starts to dry and leave it there until it dries enough to hold its form and then take it out shape it give it the final shaping and allow it to continue drying hanging on say a bottle or something 
uh, sturdy enough to support it from the top. Okay, the first thing I want to do is make sure I have a piece of doubled up cheesecloth. I have always made my FCGs out of two layers of cheesecloth. Uh, one layer is just simply too cheesy. You can see right through it and it gives away pretty much immediately what it is. When you have two layers, the glow kind of masks that. And it still is pliable as a single layer and moves in the same fashion that gives it that ghostly look. Uh, so it's, it's really nice. Uh, let's take the first one that we're gonna do and get an idea. Yeah, I'm just gonna cut that much off starting here, up here at the top. You can uh, take the excess off the sides if you want. I'm just gonna leave it on there and use it. What I can do is double it up. Yeah, let's go ahead and make this, this hood a real opaque piece by taking four layers to make the, uh... we're kind of experimenting live here, so hang in there with me. Maybe I can get three, let's see what happens. Let's do one and then another. That didn't quite work, let's try it again. This part, yeah, like that. That gives us a real nice thick cowl when it dries. And again, it doesn't have to go all the way down there to the bottom. Working with dip and drape is messy. You will probably want to wear gloves and keep water nearby for wash up when things get sticky. Protect your workspace and use parchment paper to avoid gluing things to your work surface. Drying time is typically overnight, so prepare to be patient. Here, I am painting on extra undiluted draping fluid with a brush. My initial mixture was too thin and this fixed the problem well. Okay, we have a little piece of cheesecloth about this size, looks like about 18 inches, 19 inches deep, top to bottom. <coughs> And this, it's folded in half. So this is about, I mean, it looks like, a, I don't have a ruler with me. It's about a foot, I guess. Uh, you can break this any way you want. We're just gonna try this. Um, I've got my hood here. And the first thing we're gonna do is put a bead of tacky glue across the top and fold it over. So we'll have kind of a, a hood uh, that will be stiff that we can position as it, as it starts to harden. Uh, you can roll this into a seam with, between your fingers like this. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, it's kind of a little roll. I used to do this when we uh, put the seams together on the large FCG and it works really, really well. It's a nice tight seam, it's just as good as sewing, and there we have it. We don't have to wait for that roll to dry. I'm just mashing it together real good, getting the excess spread out. Uh, and there's enough stickiness on here. I'm gonna center it on the hood as best as I can letting some of it hang over the front. 
and I'm gonna go ahead and come down the whole length of the hood. I'm gonna do that. Drip a little bit more on here, like that. Do that. And then we're gonna let that dry before we continue on. See, now we've got the body, the back and body of the ghost. This is the simplest way I know to do this. Uh, the arms are also gonna be draped across the top and come down here and here. And you'll be surprised how effective this is when it's flying. Uh, see, we've got a continuity here and out from the hood. We see cloth and not the, uh, not the hardened shell behind it. That's what the idea is. We do want to have a, a semblance of a, a real shroud because uh, the Claude Coates ghost is shrouded and a reference to a shrouded corpse. Okay, while that was drying, I played with this and discovered that there's a really good way to do this. And wrap it around the back of the shroud, about the middle of this area. The top of it will be right there, and we want this to be where these two arms fall at equal lengths. Obviously, they've got to be more or less equal. What we're going to be doing is we're going to bring it around front. We're going to bring each part of this piece of cloth around front. Be sure to pull out all your overlapping shroud that we just built and with the rolled hem and bring that out so that it's extended as far as it can be. And we're gonna be coming around and gluing. And run it right, literally run the glue right here on the back of this. Get this pretty damp with glue so it'll adhere all the way through when it finishes. And bring it up, bring your line of glue all the way up here to the middle of the, uh, the back of the head. Okay, roll that back in the center and press it down real good. Okay, now move it a little bit on the uh, parchment so it doesn't stick too badly. Incidentally, it doesn't matter if you're using the folded edge of this or the open edge of this, it's not gonna make a, a hill of beans worth of difference. May even be better if you use the, the non-folded uh, edge, the edge that's just loose because it gives a more, maybe it gives a, a, a more interesting look. Bring the arm around and down. Now we're gonna close it in the front once this dries. I wanna show you exactly what we have now. I've made some adjustments to what we just did to make things work a little bit better. The first thing I did while this was drying was join, to make a neckline, I joined the bottom of this cowl, this stiff dip and drape cowl that we made initially, and I glued it at the bottom into what you see here. You notice that the arm piece travels up over the cowl now and down to here and then tacks here and comes out just like angel wings or whatever. I am going to take this, this body part of the shroud that we put on initially and join it together here and do it as best you can do it. We're going to gather this together and, and close it up like this as you can see here. Uh, it will look a lot more like a ghost under black light flying. It's stiff enough to really reshape. As you can see right now, it's holding what I'm doing to it. Glue it here and then bring this body part around to cover up the finite length. And this will give it more of a continual texture. And as you can see now, it's one flowing, uh, one flowing piece from top to bottom when you do that.
we'll make a correction or a adjustment to this ghost. Spread this out a bit, like so. Also to the bottom of this arm. All right, that gives us a nice, much nicer, wider torso. All items we mention in this how-to are linked in the comments. 